Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I'm Jill Escher. I am the president of NCSA, and I'm your host today. And I know uh, there's been a little vacation going on um, and just incredibly busy end of summer. And um, now I'm kind of getting back in gear and I have incredible people lined up to appear on our podcast. Let me explain to you. We're going to have a short series um, coming up this fall, starting today. I recently attended a conference last week in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, that was called the Together for Choice Conference. It's my second time going to this conference. And Together for Choice is a coalition of, I don't even know how many, 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 many providers of services, programs, and housing across the country for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and many of those you know, include autism as well. So what uh, we, we, they had incredible speakers you know, throughout, throughout the conference. So I asked three of them, um, to appear on this podcast because I think that they deserve, or you deserve, actually you listeners, you deserve to hear what they had to say, not just the people in that room. And these are extraordinary people who are doing amazing things um, to serve people with with IDD. Um, so we're going to start with the first one today, and then you'll have two more coming up. We also have another, um, another uh, podcast coming up that's sort of an adapted webinar with Amy Lutz who was also a speaker at the conference. So actually you're getting four, not three, um, from a spinning off from the conference. So thank you for Together, to, together for Choice. Um, so everybody, I'm gonna welcome right now our guest today. Her name is Molly no Nocon, and she is the CEO of NOAA Homes, which is here in my state of California, but not in my area. It's way down south near San Diego. Uh, I'm waving at you. And- um, <laughs> Molly is absolutely a complete legend in the world of IDD housing. Everybody knows her. Everybody I've talked to admires her so much. How she's grown her, well, you'll learn about it, <laughs> um, her operation, um, the quality with which she approaches her work, and her pioneering ideas about serving people over their lifespan. So Molly, welcome. Thank you very much, Jill. I appreciate you uh, taking some time with us. Yeah, no, this is great. If you mind starting off telling us, how did you even get into this field in the first place? I think I'm like a lot of other people out there that had a family member with a disability and saw there was a need and it affected my family. So of course I had to jump in and figure out how to fix it. And 26 years later, it's not fixed, but I'm still involved and have made some inroads into it and have tried to understand what other families need going along the road. So started off with a brother with Down syndrome and saw him walking the path into what we thought was just bad behaviors that turned out to be Alzheimer's. And that began my journey. How old was he when he started showing symptoms? He was about 50, 52, 53, when some early signs came on, signs of forgetfulness, signs of um, not always being able to focus. And uh, he, he actually progressed rather slowly. And I, I would say the full onset of Alzheimer's probably hit him around 56, which is a little bit later than some of the Downs folks yeah. do. but. Um, about that time. So you got involved in NOAA Homes when? How long ago? I first got involved in 1996 when both of my parents died rather close to each other. They died within a couple of years and my brother was pretty independent, but he was always used to uh, going to work and socializing with his friends. And my sister and I didn't live quite close enough to do that. And we said, well, gosh, you can just come live with, with us. And he said, nope, I need my own place. I need my own routine and uh we just didn't quite understand that yeah well let me say i wouldn't want to live it. with my brothers either i would <laughs> I, he's a normal guy who doesn't want to live with siblings but go ahead I know. true <laughs> and, I, and i found out being the younger sister he doesn't pay much attention to me anyway because when, when my <laughs> father was dying he said herbie you make sure and take care of the take care of your sisters you're the man of the house now so that became a lifelong um, obstacle because I had to call my older sister who ended up moving to Colorado and say, please tell her to go to the doctor. Please tell him to brush his teeth. Mm. Tell him he has to do this. Wow. But um, I was a family member at Noah Homes for probably 10 years. And then of course got the proverbial knock to come help out on the board when I had two smaller children and I swore up and down, I didn't have much money, but I would do what I could to help. And about uh, five years later, 
uh, the East founder needed to retire and uh, I got thrown into the magical role of president of the board during that earlier time frame, and then moved from there to an interim director and about eight months later became the director of Noah Hall, the, the CEO of Noah Hawks and had never done something like that. My background was in business. I was a, a major in accounting and financial management and marketing. And I had a small business while I was raising my kids doing that and never thought I could do something like this. So I thought my brother didn't listen to me. His friends aren't going to either. And <laughs> thankfully they did. They thought I was kind of cool and I was the boss. So the rest of them listened to me. Well, um, yeah, not, not a human services background, but clearly a passion for uh, the population. So can you describe for the listeners what it is? Maybe you can just even kind of visually kind of describe what the campus is like, what the programs are like. So Noah Homes is one of those beautiful places that when my sister and I walked on the beautiful community setting that it was on, we can't can't use that word campus, even though it feels like a beautiful, absolutely gorgeous uh, setting of, of homes. There were um, eight homes at the time on about eight acres. And Noah Homes started off as an alfalfa farm with one farmhouse and six residents and six staff. And the founder had an amazing vision to create this beautiful campus community of uh, larger homes that allowed uh, up to 70, 78 residents initially uh, when I got there were living there. And we had a couple of smaller homes in the nearby community where they could walk to the campus. By the time I had arrived, we had a beautiful community center. We had uh, some outbuildings where there was plenty of room to do activities. We had probably 25 vehicles and we were within a mile of the large, of a good shopping center. And all of our folks that live at Noah Homes needed to have a work program or a volunteer situation. They needed to get out in the community every day. They, we looked at this as their job, as their opportunity to interact. So they all took off in the morning and we uh, had some peace and quiet for from about nine to two to get everything ready for them to come back. And then off they came back and then all the activities happened in the community center. And they led a very active social life. I'm sure most of the family members out there can say that our kids live a much happy, happier and bigger social life than we do. And very true at Noah Homes. Got it. So it's still this nine acre uh, community. We're a nine acre community uh, with mm -hmm. the other homes nearby. We're about 12 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a beautiful, beautifully landscaped property where people can come and wander and they can be on their own. They don't need to be directed. The property is not fenced by any matter of means, but it's very safe and it's somewhat um, somewhat secluded. We have a high school on one side and kind of an open open area on the other side and, some, and a neighborhood. So it feels very safe and uh, residents can go from house to house as they choose. And if they don't like what's happening at their house, they can knock on their friend's door or see what's going on and invite themselves on that activity. Uh, when before the height of COVID, we had people out on cruises and to Disneyland and the Padre games and you name it, we had them going and had some phenomenal times. And then, of course, COVID shut a lot of that down and we're working our way back to get it going. But we've already gone on a couple of cruises, which has been great. That's always a big activity with the residents. And whenever we ask them what they'd like to do more of, it's always vacations, cruises, Padre games, things like that. So it's a very active community. And we always say that our residents are fortunate enough to have a home with a community within a community. And uh, one of the things we hear all the time is, I love being at Noah Homes. I'm just normal here. Nobody calls me names. Nobody gets mad at me, I'm just normal. And it's it's an, a wonderful thing to hear somebody say that has obviously taken some bad behavior out in the community to come home and say, I don't have that here. This is just this is just my place in my life and I feel safe and I, I feel normal. And I, I always like to hear that. Yeah, you know, um, we are of course the National Council on Severe Autism and you know the profile of um, the residents at NOAA Home, from, from what I can tell um, is, uh, you know, not not a severe autism profile. It it seems pro predominantly you know Down syndrome and or similar presentations to Down say other developmental disabilities, congenital issues. I think you probably also serve you know CP. Um, you know uh, uh, you I'm I'm sure you have some clients with autism as well. Um, but we do, but, and, yeah. and we we broadened that a bit in the last couple of years. And we have cerebral palsy, fragile X, uh, uh, several dual diagnosis, um, some mm -hmm. other just. Um, you know, brain traumatic injuries type, that kind of thing that might've happened that caused them to have issues down the road. Yeah. So yeah, kind of a mixture, but no, we've never really been in a situation because we are wide open. We're not any kind of enclosed facility. We don't really have any um, behavioral behavioral homes. We've never, we've never gone that direction initially. And uh, so it's, it's, it's behavioral from the sense that, that people that need adjustment and can, can grow through it. We've had a lot of youngsters that have 
grown up through their behaviors and have become very good residents of NOAA homes. And mm. thankfully, now that I've opened the memory care homes, which was the, le the legacy that my brother created for us, we can now tell somebody that when your youngster comes to us at 18 years of age, given a regular progression of life and no major medical issues, they're going to live their life out at NOAA homes if that's what they choose. And now they can be there till end of life because we have the ability and the staffing to make that happen for them. Right. Well, let's talk about that towards the end of the, the discussion. But I think people probably know that um, individuals with Down syndrome are at increased risk for um, developing Alzheimer's um, at a relatively early age. We talked about that with reference to your, your brother um, and that you're doing some pioneering work um, in that field because there's the, you know kind of this missing gap, <laughs> a big gap in the system, especially now that people with Down syndrome are living longer lives. You had a slide at the conference that talked about how the lifespan of people down has been increasing and increasing, increasing over time, which is right. really great. But that also means that there's more demand for dementia care. Absolutely. And I think the hardest thing that was hard to swallow when this all started for me was the state, the state, the state nor the country had any plans whatsoever. And, and the ongoing commentary was, we just didn't expect them to live this long. They were supposed to be gone already. Yeah. And as the slide showed in 1983, the average life of somebody with Down syndrome was 25. It's now, I believe it's up to 60 at this point now, and it's, they're, they're moving on beyond that. So they're living a normal yeah. life, but the number one killer of Down syndrome folks is now Alzheimer's because they yeah. are living long enough to get it. And that's that's another scary piece. Yeah, I had a tenant, I'm a provider of um, low-income IDD housing up here in Northern California, and I had a tenant, she was over 60 years old, you know, with Down syndrome, and she definitely had dementia. And yeah. very sweet, gentle woman, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I've definitely see, seen it with my with my own eyes. She was a real fixture in her community. Everybody knew her, a lovely person. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about these big issues, you know, these big broad issues that have to do with choice and, indivi and individualized person-centered planning for adults with IDD. I also want to talk about the realities of the financial constraints um, and how how you're funded, how people you know, are fortunate enough to end up at one of your in one of your homes. Um, but tell me about your experience kind of fighting this fight to ensure that people like your brother and your residents who absolutely you know, love living there, you know, can retain this choice. I'm sure that you're the target of uh, finger pointing by um, advocates who believe that you are, you know, um, uh, you know, stripping them of their autonomy or something crazy like that. I want to tell you just a, anecdotally, when I walked into Opportunity Village in Las Vegas, which is where this conference was held, by the way, if you guys haven't heard of Opportunity Village, I was completely blown away. I had no idea what to expect. I hadn't done my homework, but I walk into Opportunity Village to go to this conference. I don't think in my entire life I have ever seen a happier group of adults with IDD ever. They were clearly, they owned the place. They were hanging out together. They were laughing. They were having fun. They had all these activities going on. I mean, they were coming up and talking to us and there's so much camaraderie. I, I just, the, the feeling there was so overwhelmingly positive. I think how, how could anybody want to take away this as an option? I'm not saying it's for everybody. It, it blows my mind that we've so demonized something that should be so accepted. But anyway, that was a long introduction. <laughs> I'd love to have your perspective on this particular political quagmire. We've, we've certainly been in the middle of it. I'm sure you know, being in California, that we had a fight last um, just this last July to get our rate back. And we lost, uh, we, we had 10 homes, 90 residents, which equated to about an $850,000 increase we were expecting on July 1 and we found out on July on June 30th that that wasn't going to happen that they had chosen to they quote, singled go, out you guys they singled out large facilities anything with seven beds or more if you were six beds or under you got your funding if you were seven beds or more you did not and the commentary from the state was we've chosen to go in a different direction and we spent four months basically fighting with the state trying to understand how they could choose and discriminate against a population that chose to live in a community setting. And long and the short of the story, after having to hold rallies and being on the news and frankly getting to the governor's office multiple times through various supporters around the state and working with others, a number in the Bay Area, there ended up being about five of us in the end that, that became the negotiation uh, 
party with the state. And they finally just came back to us and said, we not only gave you your rate back, but we made it retroactive to July 1 because we ran out of reasons to pay you less for doing more. <laughs> and <Right. laughs> I thought, okay, at least you're honest. And it's, yeah. it's doggone politics, but it's somebody who decided that seniors can live together, veterans can live together, homeless can live together, drug addicts can live together in rehab. But for some reason, a person with a disability, you put more than six together and that's an institution. So there's no 55 plus for them. There's no tennis communities. There's no nothing communities. There is you need to be thrilled to be thrown into a four bed home out in the community. And of course that next door neighbor is going to be your best friend. So that's exactly where we want you right. all to be. I'm yeah, because I've, I've never seen this. that happen by the way. I know, I know. I've told and this I'm, story before, but I'll, t I'll tell it again because you'll appreciate it. Because as I said, I'm, I'm a landlord and I have, um, I have, you know, I have 13 tenants with, with IDD and I have one tenant with a pretty severe case of autism. And it's a clustered, um, you know, property. And so like right behind his home is another home. And um, I had a tenant who had been living there for two years and I went to go visit them. We were chit-chatting. I said, Hey, you know, how's it going with Joe? Do you guys get along? You know, you, got, you know, what's it like? And that Joe's the pseudonym for the uh, fellow with autism. And they're like, we've never seen him. We've oh, never yeah. seen him. Yeah, because that's because uh, apparently our neighbors are supposed to be our best friends, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's it's so absurd that we're, we use these, you know, uh, fantasies, right, to fuel policy that are completely detached from reality. So uh, and if people would just come see like you saw Opportunity Village, it's not for everybody, but it's for a lot of people. And it's, yeah, it's not, a choice they should have. Mm -hmm. So in this day of having so few choices and so few, so little choice of housing, especially in California, why in the world would you take away options? Exactly. And I, that was something that kind of hit hard with DDS in California, that they were literally taking away options. And they know darn well, they can't meet the housing crisis with four bed homes. They, they know that. And uh, we're making some inroads. I mean, we one of my ways of fighting is not to make enemies. It's just to make such a nuisance of myself. They finally say, oh, my God, just make her go away. Give her what she <laughs> wants. And it works really well. I'm really I'm really I'm really good at that. And uh so yeah. we're actually well, starting to work on a housing project that I think could help people around the country. And that's, that's what, that's what kind of started the, the, the thought of we're talking at, at together for choice and, and what we're doing with it. So we actually held a housing summit at NOAA about three weeks before together for choice. And it was a gathering of like-minded people who also wanted to solve this problem around the country. And it was, it was, uh, it went well. So there's hope on the horizon, I think. Um. Well, you know, I hope so. There's so many obstacles in the way. It's it's unbelievable. So uh, can, I, can we ask, talk about funding a little bit? So, you know, there's the brick and mortar of Noah Homes. I mean, you obviously came in with the land, obviously, I think free and clear. Um, but, you know, the, the homes and obviously the supports, the staff, uh, you have, from what I can tell from your website, 90 residents and, and 130 staff, right? People, yep. this isn't Willowbrook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. this is the this is the reverse. This is the opposite. This yeah. is like where you're you have so many staff caring for these people. So, how do you um? Could you just paint a broad picture of how you're funded and how you sustain yourself? Sure. So in California, there's basically four funding levels for housing. We are a licensed residential home. We're not medically licensed. We're licensed under what they call adult residential um, facilities. And we start at a very independent level of level two, where you're kind of on your own, you're going to work, you're volunteering, and there's a staff in that house. It's a one to six staffing ratio to help you out and kind of be mom, dad, and whatever you need in the way of, of direction. Then as you progress along and you might need more help or you come in with a, a higher disability, need more help, that would go to a level three. And level three is more, I'll help you do things. I will assist you. I will give you supports on what you need to do. I'll make sure you got your meds. I'll make sure that you're getting to work. We'll help you with some of your daily living skills. If that's what you need, we're here, whatever you need, we're here to help. And we added level four when we added memory care. And as you know, in California, most, most level fours are behaviorals. Right. And yeah. that was the only funding available. And there's different us. levels in level four, by the way, people. There are. So it goes up to what, four I? Four I. So we, yeah. we negotiate with regional center. San Diego Regional Center is probably the most reasonable regional center in the entire state. And they're very well known for being willing to look at out, out, of, the, off the, out of the box projects and being mm -hmm. willing to help. If you're willing to do the work, they're willing to help. So Carlos Flores was a... Uh, executive director at the time, he certainly did do that. And he gave us the 4I funding level. 
And he also gave us additional support support money. So at, at NOAA Homes, when you come in and you uh, want to live there, you don't pay anything. You come in as a um, client of San Diego, or the regional center system in California, and whatever your disability allows in the way of funding and supports, that's what we take for full payment. So well, if, let me just uh, explain something to you, non-Californians sure. who are listening. Um, the regional centers are funded by Medicaid dollars, and that's federal dollars with the state matching funds. I think right now it's something like 40% federal, 60% state. I could be wrong. We're on not, the edges I'm not there. sure on that one. I couldn't tell you, but yeah. it doesn't sound but it's But it's essentially Medicaid dollars. It's just that we have something called regional centers, whereas other states do not. You will have your usually your DD agency. Um, but anyway, so you so you, the clients are referred from the San Diego Regional Center, and um, then uh, you know the the regional center payments will pay for all of their services, or do you have to get other streams of income to help you? Technically, they pay for everything, but technically, as, as we are an entitlement state, we are supposed to be able to cover all of that. We all know as providers, it does not, and Noah Homes pays about. 40% of the cost of keeping somebody there in most cases. And uh, we fundraise now at about a million, a million and a half a year to keep our residents accustomed to the level of care and quality that we demand. And yeah. also to keep our staff paid at a rate that allows them to stay. We have very strong tenured senior staff, uh, many of whom have been there 10 years plus. Mm -hmm. But we have some of the same problems in the general staff that come in that, you know, our turnover used to be uh, 20, 15, 25%, and we hit. 40% during COVID and we're now back down to about 30, 35, I think, but we struggle like everybody else to try to keep those folks in the houses because in and outs down the street and so is Starbucks. And now they're um, in California. Don't we have a minimum wage of $20 for fast food $20 workers? $20 an hour next, next July one for anybody working in fast food, that's going to go to 25 and I think in four years. So, right. So they could be a barista or, you know, they could work in, you know, with IDD. And I think that you know, yeah, and stay up all night at. and try to try to help right. them as there. And then we're asking young children, this young children, young people, mm -hmm. as we looked at the memory care, we were asking, we, one of the conversations we had to have with ourselves and others is we're asking an 18 year old to wa watch somebody die because our goal was to keep these folks in their homes through end of life care. And we, we don't hire people that are already trained in the industry. We have to train them. And that was a struggle as well. And some some were okay and some were not. And we understood and we provided our own, we created our own training. We created our own program content to make sure that we supported them as much as we could. And that was another big piece wow. for us. Is, uh, so how these we, are people who are generally unskilled, but engaging what is in essentially hospice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hospice. Which is hard us. work. Very awesome. hard work. And yeah. in memory care homes, they are staffed sometimes one-to-one. -one. And that's what keeps them in the home. Wow. So let, let's yeah. talk about this memory care because you know, in, in autism, if you look at our, our bubble, our population bubble, you know, the adults with autism are generally in their 20s and 30s right now. And then as you go past about age 35, 40, it drops pretty precipitously. We don't have a big population of adults with autism who are at end of life, at least not through natural causes. You mm -hmm. know, there's always, you know, the wandering and the drowning and, you know, right. the seizures and all that. Um, but, you know, what, what you're doing obviously has much more relevance to the Downs um, population. But how is it different? Like, like yeah, as, as we parents get older and our kids get older and we think about, it's hard to think about my kids getting older. They're 24 and 17 right now. What are some of the issues that happen in terms of the, the system, if you will? Um, because I know that there are age limits, for example, on, on eligibility. Can you explain the differences with an older client? Sure. When I came to NOAA in 2008, there was a rule on the books for the community care licensing branch that licenses all of us and dings us if we do something wrong. And doesn't say a word if we do something right, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> all used to that too. Um, they they had a, pl a plan in place that if your if your resident reached age sixty, you immediately ship them out to a nursing home. Didn't matter why or how. It's just oh, they're over age sixty, you can't take oh, care of them. Wow. So I said I no, 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 that. we can't do that. That's terrible. And so that's we got terrible. a deal with them that if we if they said okay, fine, if you can take care of them, write us a letter and tell us how you're going to take care of them, how you're going to support them, and you have to send us a letter every year. 
Well, after about three or four years of letters coming, not only from us, but providers all over the, the county, I'm sure this was, I'm sure this is probably statewide. They said a note out and said, no, 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 don't send us a letter unless you can't take care of them. Stop sending the letters. So then it became they could stay because we all come up with creative ways to keep them there. But when one of our residents Doesn't died, it rather, cost them less because nursing homes are very expensive. Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But except when part of the deal was for a regional center, which I don't really think that was a big deal. But you you pass you pass them off of your budget over to Medicare or Medicaid. So they became a different pot of money. Um, it's still part of the DD system, but it's not part of regional center. So they became they got they got offloaded off their case roster. So it, it it did help a little bit, but I don't know that that was really a huge piece because once they got in the nursing home, that was kind of the end. There was no program. There was no nothing. It was just there in the nursing home. Right. So and you're not- right. And like when you're at Noah Homes, you have activities going on. It's just completely different. I mean, you have uh, classes, you have parties, uh, you have um, it seems like day programs. I don't know if they're your day programs or other people's day programs. Um, we, but- we did we did start a home homebound day program because one of the things that the state didn't understand either is that when people get into that age and they're I mean, we've got we have other people that are not Down syndrome that that are in memory care because they want to retire and they're tired and they don't they don't want to have skills they have to meet to meet their funding. They just want to <laughs> their skill is to get up and get dressed and have fun that day right. and to you know participate in music therapy and to take a walk with their take a walk with their friend and those are their skill sets. So we've manage that as well. The other thing we really got past is this whole behavioral thing, because when you're in a level four behavioral, every behavior had to be modified and you had to have therapists come in. Well, there aren't behaviors for somebody with with Alzheimer's. They're just, they have Alzheimer's. And most right, of them right. are just people that need more care, need more help. They need to people to understand what they're dealing with. And the hardest part is when you look at somebody with Alzheimer's, we can explain to ourselves that there's a chance that if we start getting forgetful, we can understand we have Alzheimer's or we're moving towards dementia, we're having those issues. Try to explain that to a young man who's very happy and everything's fine and he doesn't get why he can't look at me and my brother couldn't remember my name or he couldn't understand why he didn't get why I wasn't there on Saturday. And he would sit at that front door of the office waiting for me to come and the staff was gracious and let him sit for a couple hours or as long as they check on him and when they didn't want to come back, they could see him out the window. And if he didn't want to come back, he didn't. But mm-hmm. try to explain that to somebody with autism. You know, now you're dealing with your autism. By right. the way, now you're going to have to mention your brain's going to atrophy. It's not easy to do, and there's a lot of trauma that goes on in their brains as they're trying to manage all this. So it's a yes, it's uh, it's Alzheimer's, but yes, it's another layer of struggles that these folks have, and I don't think a lot of people right. think of it that way. Right. Yeah. You know, for someone who didn't come from a human services background, you you certainly <laughs> you certainly get it. You, you know, it seems to be part of who you are? Um, I have a very, very smart staff. And I've mm-hmm. had people that, have, I mean, there's people that have been there almost since the beginning of NOAA and they grew up, these are their families and they grew up yeah. with these folks and they knew them. So I got a wonderful yeah. education, but I was also never afraid to ask why, how, what do we need to do? What's that mean? What's that initial mean? What's that acronym mean? So I learned a lot by the School of Hard Knocks because I either got made fun of or they felt bad because they were being above our heads and they should have thought about that. And uh and some of it was just all of us had to learn. We were now in a research project with UCSD and they are looking at 35 years of records of I think 15 of our Down syndrome folks at least, maybe 20. And they're gonna spend two years with us looking at um, blood pressures, weights, nutrition values, uh, psych evals, uh, works, work patterns, home patterns, uh, social skills. And we're gonna have a conversation about why a community setting like a NOAA Homes can actually be more advantageous. We're very positive and very, um, hopeful from where, how we're looking at things that Noah Holmes is going to prove to be a much better model than what my brother would have gotten at home with me because he would have been on his own or maybe what he would have gotten living in a four bed or a six bed home. But we're going to have some data to finally show that because one of the things the state always says to us and the, and the feds will prove to us that you're a better setting as a congregate you know, cluster campus setting, prove to us that you're better than a four bed or a six bed. Well, we don't have time to prove it. We just are trying to keep the doors open. But uh, UCSD thought it was enough and it thought it was valuable enough because we've been involved in many of their research trials for people with Alzheimer's and Down syndrome. And so we we talked to them and, and sold them on the idea that we need to have this research for these folks to have more choices. And uh, and they mm-hmm. recognize how much better the care is when they see a resident from Noah Holmes versus someplace else. So we want to prove oh, that yeah. in writing. So hopefully in a year and a half, we'll be co-published with UCSD and we will be able to show the world 
we know what we're doing and that we all agree that a community setting like a Noah Holmes, unlike many others, uh, there's beautiful ones up in your areas too, um, are a choice and they just need to be a choice. We've never asked to be the only one. We've never said shut down all the four bed for God's sake, they're pig, they're whole, mm-hmm. just get rid of them. We've never said mm-hmm. that. We just said, give us more choices. We want We want as many choices as we can get. I mean, listen, the state of California has what, 380,000 people with developmental disabilities now? Uh, 460,000 at last count. Oh, was it 460? I'm, bu- I'm so behind. Yeah, you're behind. <laughs> you're behind like about a year or two. So yeah, it's a little higher. I mean, how? Uh, it, it defies belief that anybody can think that of the, a population that big, they all have to fit into like one or two, you know, dinky models. I mean, we need everything. Yes, some people will live alone. Yes, some people will live in an apartment. Yes, some people will live in group homes. Yes, some people will live in farms. Yes, some people live in community settings. I mean, some people will live in, you know, family home arrangements. I mean, it's like, don't we need it all? Isn't that obvious? And that you, we're supposed to have these person-centered principles, but it seems like we just kick those person-centered principles out the door, right? To yeah. bow down to this idea that everybody has to live isolated in the community. Well, I think as much as we all know, being family members and talking about the person-centered planning and the uh, all the different things they're trying to accomplish, it's great. But you better have a family member that can manage it for you. You better have a family member that can pick up the shifts when those people that you have in supported living just didn't show up because somebody has to run the shift. And we're also getting a lot of calls lately from very tired, exhausted parents who thought that putting their child in a condo or if they had the means to buy something and do it with other families, they did that. But now they're finding they're now... Acting, acting as a case manager because if if these mm-hmm. agencies that they've hired to send people to staff don't show up it's on them right. and it's and many have come to know and said would you just manage this for us and i said are you crazy i said i'm, I'm managing 90 now no i'm not going to run to your house right. and manage your guys but they need help yeah. and they're trying to figure it out so we are working with some other groups trying to and actually one of them is a specific autism group because we have another three and a half acres at NOAA we'd like to develop and one of the things we've talked about is um, how can we bring in more of the high behavioral folks who we are tragically hearing are now left in emergency rooms and drugged. And there's no uh, transitional homes for them to go to and they're thrown yeah. from one home to another and they, yeah. they freak out, of course, because they were in that first home 10 years and on Tuesday, they're in another home. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're trying to understand how we can help with that. And, and you're right, when I was first there and it, it's a Catholic, Catholic organization that serves all face, I had a wonderful nun who was our director and took care of the folks. She had a severely... Um, a severe disability uh, sister that lived in another home that she took mm-hmm. care of on the weekends when she wasn't at NOAA. And when my brother died, I said, you know what? There's a couple people I've spoken to on the on our list. We, we normally have about between 150 and 250 people on our waiting list. So mm-hmm. it's a big list. And uh, I, I said, you know, I'm seeing and hearing more about autism. We need to look at this. And this was in 2010. And she said, Molly, Molly, no, 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 don't, don't think of that. She said, you know, our little Downs folks, they're just the nicest, sweetest little folks. Yeah. Why would you want to work with those autism folks? They're difficult. They've got, they've got, you know, God bless them. They've got such a hard road. We, we don't know how to work with them. And I said, I don't think we knew how to work with Down syndrome folks and fragile X folks either, but you figured it out. So an autistic child um, replaced my, took my brother's bed, which I thought was kind of cool. And um, we, we do have a number of folks with autism, but they're not, they're not the ones that, that, that need the homes the most. They're not the high behaviors. And right. so this group that I'm working with is working on what would a, a home look like that we could integrate and, you know, how, what percentage of a community can we, can we dedicate to the high, the high needs and still make the community functional and still keep everybody safe and still give them what they need. So it's really been nice to have them kind of be the think tank and they've all got children with this, with, with high autism. Does the group <laughs> have a name or is it just a. It's a housing, a housing committee right now. We're mm-hmm. kind of working on a name and uh, we're hoping San that. San Diego area families, I assume. Uh, yeah, but there's actually somebody who's joining us from from Oregon, and and our goal is that these that these plans we put together, we're actually deal, working with. You met, I think you heard Jim Whitaker from um, Arthur yeah. Jacksonville. Well, Jim put together a really cool plan. He kind of talked about it, a five thousand square foot home that had I think it's six, five or six individual apartments within the home, and when you walked in the front door, you you saw somebody else's front door when you walked in the door because mm-hmm. all their front doors opened into the home, and they had a, they had a central area as well. But they worked, the state of Florida allowed more funding for dual diagnosis of a disability and um, and a psychological issue. So he was able to tap into that, double up on the, the funding and get enough funding to keep these folks at the higher behavioral ones needed the help. And they're right next door to the Ark of Jacksonville, um, their community village. So that gives them a chance to integrate. And they're, they're also working towards the ones they think that can get better and integrate into a, a lesser um, intense uh, mm-hmm. environment. Mm-hmm. So 
we all have pieces we can solve. And our, our goal is, can we come up with the non-negotiables up top that there's a direct access to a medical clinic, that there are choices in homes and apartments and townhomes, and that there are choices in whether you do or don't want to have a roommate. I mean, I got massacred for daring to put two, two putting roommates in the, in the memory care homes. And we have four two, bed, two bedrooms and two one bedrooms. And our plan was when they got to end stage, that we would move them into the one bed and that would become the hospice rooms. Mm. Well, today, six years later, not a single resident allowed us to move their roommate out. They said, no, no, they're my roommate. They're staying. Mm. So we have a screen that we put in the middle of the room and mm -hmm. the families visit, but they're there with their roommate. We The single room is just a single room. And the, the, the roommates keep each other alive. They stimulate each other. They talk to each other. They make the other person get up. They make them get dressed. I mean, it's just like any other social thing. So you know, poo poo on those people who said everybody's got to have a single bed. That was for the daughter in memory in these beautiful memory care homes who was guilty that they were putting mom, placing mom in a memory care. So they needed to make sure they had a single room to be to get rid of their guilt. It has nothing to do with the, the person's needs. It has to do with the families getting rid of their guilt. And I learned mm. that after touring new, numerous beautiful places. And that was the mm. comment all the time. Oh no, we market to the daughter. <laughs> Poor daughter. That's not nice. But that's what yeah. they do. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, things should be actually focused on the needs of the individuals. It shouldn't be that hard. It should, should be that simple. Everything should be focused on that right. instead of all these other obfuscations and um, just sort of like irrelevant ideologies. I mean, you know. My, like my biggest comment to anybody is if they haven't come to see me, or see an opportunity village or see somebody else. I just respectfully say, then you really don't have a conversation with me about your, your values because you have not witnessed and seen how right. people with disabilities have chosen to live. So when you come see us, we can have that conversation. Uh, reality doesn't matter, Molly. <laughs> I know it's so true. It's so true. It's, but you know, every once in a while I go outside and I think, I, I think there's somebody out here who has something real to say. I know I'll find, I, and so I, I try to, I try to hang out with people like you guys at those conferences so that we can all have a, a day and a half of, of reality and then go back to the grind. <laughs> well, is it just amazing to, um, you know, learn about your, your work and now to, you know, learn a little bit about what you're doing, kind of looking into serving people with autism who even <gasps> have behaviors. Um, yeah, you know, I have, yeah. I have one daughter with autism. Her, her behavior is pica. So she's always putting stuff in her mouth, but she doesn't really have other behaviors. Then I have another son uh, with severe autism, who's all about the behaviors. I, so I see the vast differences, even under the autism, you know, umbrella, just, just dramatic differences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, kids like my son are very hard to serve. And so I'm of course the case manager. Now you were talking about how the parents are the case manager. Well, right. that's me. Yeah. And you know, it, he, ha it's a corporation for basically one person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, who needs a very complex level of care? You know, it, it's interesting, Medicaid, we're supposed to be, you know, uh, not in favor of institutions, but, you know, Medicaid, to be eligible for these dollars, you have to be in need of an institutional level of care. At yeah. least they acknowledge that's true. Right. I mean, right. my kids can't do a thing for themselves, not one thing. They need an institutional level of care. And we're supposed to be able to provide an institutional level of care with somebody making, you know, $17 an hour. Um, who's untrained and who's stoned all the time, by the way, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been there, done that. Um, and you know, it, it's just, it, 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 it's just so crazy. I think those of us with reality brains remember that when those lovely, horrible institutions that were around in the seventies yeah. and sixties and seventies got closed down and the pendulum went this way yeah. and said nothing but for bed, we're all kind of hoping, please, please, can we please come back to at least here and let us have right a setting where a child of, of what, I mean, Noah Homes could be a setting like that because the community is very involved and there could be a very simple oversight with the, you know, California already has regional centers. We get case, we get case workers that just come to our houses to hang out because we, we don't give them receipts in a, in a shoe box. We actually have them on a ledger sheet. So they just come and hang out with us because they are, we, we make work a little bit easier for them. And we're thinking, mm -hmm. no, go somewhere else, go somewhere that, you know, they need more help, but there are ways to do it in a very, professional and and humane way but just like the homeless population some of those folks god bless them they need to have care they just they are they're on the street because we got rid of every place they could have gone for help yeah i mean don't even get me started on that i know another problem <laughs> that, we can't that would take problems. another hour i, I think yeah. we probably don't want to do that but i love your word reality brains i'm going to use that from now on 
Those of us. Well, with it's reality, very, very important. And I think all yeah. of us, uh, you know, if I hear one more time that, you know, the sky is the sky is purple and you have to believe that because that's what I say. And yeah. I, that's where I hear with some of these people in the industry that have obviously created a mindset. And unfortunately, I think it's a very small sector, but they're very powerful and they, yeah. they make it known. This is what we think. And if you, you say anything different, we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to fund you. Oh, we're going to yeah. try and take your money away. And right. That's yeah, where people need to stand very... up and talk scary times and i think there's some real kind of diabolical forces you know at work that are preying frankly on the most vulnerable among us and it i it, it really um worries me and uh keeps me up at night and and at this at this job but um i don't want to take up more of your time you're super busy and um it was so great to learn a bit about noah Holmes and to learn a bit about you know your your history and your future um and um i know that we will keep in touch the housing yeah. issue is just the huge for our population you know i would say more than 90 percent of parents you know in my position who have uh adult children with severe autism have absolutely no clue i know, you know it's... what they're going to do and it's it's really a monumental um, national emergency um, that's not getting the attention that it deserves. So yeah, you're right. Are, yeah, you're right. And all we can do is hope and keep praying that we find a reality. And I think, I think like anything else, we were allowed to build memory care when it became a crisis. We actually spoke with them five years before we, before we uh, built, because we said, we see this as an issue. They said, no, no, it's not an issue. No, we're fine. And three, three, four years later, I literally got a call. Hey, remember you guys talked about those memory care home things. Can you build those? We need them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Can't give you any money. Can't help you. Don't know what your funding's going to look like. But yeah, build them and we'll talk. So that was kind yeah. of what happened. But, you know, well, I think we reality, all need to do that. Yeah. Reality catches up with us eventually. It, it well, does. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Molly. Great to talk to you. And um, and we will have this up hopefully on Monday. Sounds I good, Jill. I appreciate it. it. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Okay. You have been a very strong beacon for a lot of years, and I've always appreciated that. Oh, thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.